The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everybody. Welcome to Balkan Informative Webinar on CAF Management and the role of calling in in utero programming. I'd like to briefly lay out the grand rules uh, so you can understand how the webinar will work today. As attendees, you have all been muted to minimize background noise. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, uh, please type them in the chat box you know, on your screens. And at the end of the presentation, we will uh, read the questions one by one as they come and our speaker will respond. Also, the webinar is being recorded for future viewing. You will receive a link in the coming days that you can share with your colleagues who could not attend today. Our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Marcus Zanobi, and I'd like to really thank Marcus for being with us today. Uh, I now give the floor to Dr. Stefano Vandoni, our technical services manager for EMEA at Balkim Italia and moderator of the webinar. Thank you, Tania, and uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar today. I'm very proud to introduce uh, Dr. Marcus Zenobi. Uh, Marcus is originally from Cordoba in Argentina, but uh, as an Italian, I'm very proud he has an Italian passport now. So as, uh, as, as his uh, background, he started in 2001. Uh, he studied at the National University of Cordoba and uh, he graduated then in 2006 with a degree in agriculture engineering. In 2007, he started to work uh, for the National Institute of Agriculture Technology in the, area of, in the area of animal production and provided private consulting in cattle nutrition in his area. Then in 2009, he moved to Canada where he took English lesson and pursued his master on science program in animal science. And then finally in 2013, he moved to Gainesville in Florida uh, where he studied his PhD with uh, Professor um, Staple and Jose Santos in animal science uh, uh, graduate program. He has been working in the Department of Animal Sciences in the University of Florida, and he basically uh, ran most of the uh, latest research that we uh, have done together with the University of Florida in uh, Cali. So today, Marcos will introduce about our latest results, uh, looking at uh, using choline or human protective calling and the effects on health status of the cows. So with this, uh, Marcus, it's up to you. And uh, thank you again. And uh, I leave you the, uh, the, the ground. The folio. OK. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stefano and Tanya, for giving me the opportunity to, to show the result again and maybe help us to, uh, to provide some background of what we are doing in Florida. Um, for other researchers to keep doing research on calling and fetal programming. So thank you so much. Give me a second, Stefan. Okay. Okay, it now is moving. Sorry. So basically this is showing the current practice of raising pre-winning, pre-win data heifers. Um, the later data that we have is from 2018. This is from United States. And it showed a really good progress on, for example, one of the things that we saw that we, we improved in daily, in, in raising pre-winning daily behavior was the mortality. We, we went from 8% to 5% mortality rate in the first, in the pre-winning phase. So it's a good thing. We still, we are in the lower side of average daily gain to winning which is around uh, 7.5 kilo per day or 0.75. But I think you can see that we are feeding less meal than the optimum, only 5.8 liters per day. But in terms of the colostrum, we are doing a good job. We are feeding the colostrum around or within the six hours after birth, and we're feeding around 4.5 liter of colostrum. So we are doing well on colostrum, but we, we are, still having some problem in average daily gain and mortality although it's, it's a good number five percent it's in the in the higher highest end 
However, some of the data show that still we have morbidity around 40%, which is really, really high. It's not weird to go to farms and see morbidity around 70% still. And we know that the data is pretty solid, uh, that the effects of poor calf performa, performance due to disease or diseases during the pre-weaning period can have long-term negative effects. Dr. Van Amber and his students, Sobero in 2012, they showed that 22% of the variation in the first lactation meal yield was explained by pre-weaning growth rates up to 42, 49 date of age, which is the, the weaning time, okay? So 22% of the variation in the first lactation meal yield was explained by how these heifer were raised, okay? During the pre-weaning period. It's really important to know that. So every disease that happened during the pre-weaning probably will hammer the meal production in the first lactation. And we will see some data about that. What about choline? Well, choline is an essential, essential nutrient. We know that uh, from human literature or monogastric data. And we define choline as uh, vitamins, although it's not exactly vitamin. It's an essential part of mammalian cells, like a fosfatidyl choline, and help us to solubilize different liposoluble or liposoluble compounds. We know the requirement for a pregnant mom and for a lactating man, we know the requirement of calling for a saw, and we don't know yet the requirement for a lactating or a pregnant or non-lactating and pregnant cow, and neither for the offspring, okay? But we know that the offspring, at least during the pre-weaning phase, uh, calling is an essential nutrient. Every single meal replacer in the market has calling chloride on it because calling is a requirement for this uh, offspring, okay? So we start reading about that and we were, most of our research was done on transition dairy cow, but we, then we start uh, looking at the effect of calling uh, during the close up period on the offspring performance, okay? And the idea to start looking at that is will sound funny for you, but well, I was doing my PhD with my wife. Uh, my, we have our second boy at Florida and I started reading about pre, uh, natal nutrition on human and a lot of prenatal nutrition in human was focusing on calling. So with that in mind, I was doing transition cow trials with lactating cows and I, start, uh, I had an idea or I was interested in looking at the feeder programming. So the human data is showing that the calling requirement here is for fatigue calling and here in the bottom is week of gestation. So 40 weeks is the normal uh, term for gestation in humans, we can see that there, there is a ramp up of concentration in fosfatidyl choline around the end of the gestation. So one month before calving, uh, we can see that fosfolipids in the amniotic fluid are mainly fosfatidyl choline, okay? When researchers track where this fosfatidyl choline went into the fetus, they found that 80, 80, 70 to 80 percent of the fosfolipids in the intestine and lungs are fosfatidyl choline. So here we have PC means fosfatidyl choline uh, bound to unsaturated fatty acid or saturated fatty acid. We can see, for example, in this one, in this bar, we can see that our intestine fosfolipids, and we can see that we have 15 percent of fosfolipids bound to uh, fosfatidyl choline and saturated fatty acid, and we have almost 50% of fosfatidyl choline bound to unsaturated fatty acid. So in total, it's around uh, 70 to 80%, and the same in lungs. And we can we can see in the data, in the human data, that uh, doctors trying to measure the, um, the the content of PC of fosfatidyl choline in amniotic fluid during gestation or pregnancy actually to assess lung maturity. So we think that we don't think. I mean, data suggests that the the maturation of lungs and intestine is really related to the content of fosfatidyl choline during the last period of gestation. There are some old data that show that if mom pregnant rats are fed 
deficient, marginal, moderate, or adequate diet uh, with lipotropic compounds like, for example, uh, acid folic, choline, or methylene, the offspring of those rats will have different tolerance to different challenges. So in this classic experiment in 1970, mom's pregnant rats were fed a deficient diet during the during the weeks before before um, before give birth to the to the to the offspring a marginal diet a moderate or a complete diet on lipotrop lipotropes uh, substance like here choline methionine and b12 and then what researchers did is six months later they did the challenge an lps salmonella challenge to this offspring so basically this offspring were exposed to different diet before birth hmm, in terms of the content of lipotropes and then 100 or six months later they were challenged with a disease basically and we can see the mom received during the pregnancy a diet that is deficient in lipotropes like a in choline or methionine B12, the mortality of those offspring is 100%, pretty dramatic. If the diet of the mom during the pregnancy was marginal in these uh, compounds, was still 90%. And then we start seeing a decrease when we see that the diet that received the moms or the, these rats, pregnant rats, were 35%, and then 25% if the, that diet was complete on lipotropo literals okay so it has a long-term effects what we fed to our uh, uh, pregnant animals and some of the symptoms that we see in non-ruminant when we look at the deficiency calling deficiency especially is fatty liver in dogs rats rats and people bone disease like uh, we know the porosis in young chicks so calling is heavily used in chicks Reduced number of wing piglets by 0.4 per saw. We, we saw a reduced feed intake of weight gain by rat pups. We also see an impaired immune function of lactating rat and offspring. Recently, we just published a paper showing that the cows that are uh, fed uh, calling during the transition period tend to have a better immune function compared with the control one that did not receive calling, impaired memory in rat and people, and also we saw weakness, inability to rise, labor and rapid breathing, and anoxia within four days in new, newly born dairy calf fed a calling free synthetic meal. Basically, uh, calf that are not fed calling during the first uh, few weeks after birth uh, suffering from choline deficiency. And we know that pregnancy and lactation are moments that are really associated with diminished concentration of choline and its metabolites in the liver, in rats, and also in other species. Something that we try to, to do to assess in cows, uh, we did that basically in Florida. So one of the things that we saw research in 2015, they saw in dairy cows that fosfatidyl choline, one of the metabolites that choline can be converted. We can see that there is a decrease starting weeks before calving. Zero means uh, calving. Here we can see that relative to calving and the concentration of fosfatidyl choline. We can see that the concentration of these calling compounds start decreasing from minus 14 to zero, the day of calving, stay low for two weeks and start recovering after that. So the idea to supplement rumen protected calling during the transition period basically is to maintain the level of calling of fatal calling, like it's one of the compounds, um, relative to higher than what we saw here, okay? So we wanted to see if we can modify the choline metabolites in non-lactating pregnant holes in cow that were in a negative energy status, okay? So here we can see the choline concentration of the metabolites. We can see three metabolites, fosfatidyl choline, sphingomyelin, and lysofosfatidyl choline. And what we did is to dose different, uh, different concentration of rumen protected choline, in this case we use Reassure from 0 to 120 grams of 
the commercial product. So zero, 30 gram of reassure, 60, 90 gram of reassure, and 120 gram of reassure. And what we saw to our, uh, to confirm what other researchers have seen in other species that there is a, a increase on phosphatidyl choline when we provide extra choline to the pregnant non-lactating cows. So from zero, which is this column, to 60 gram, which is the commercial dose that today is recommended, we have around 20% of increase. From a sphingomyelid, another important metabolite for immune system, we see that, again, there is an increase. Actually, we saw a lineal increase here, as basically as the dose of rumen protected choline increase, the concentration of sphingomyelid increase. But again, we saw from zero to 60 gram, we saw almost 20% increase. And for lysophosphatidyl choline, also we saw the same. There is a tendency for a lineal effect, okay? The more choline we supplement to the mom, the more lysophosphatidyl choline we can detect in the plasma of these cows. And also, very pretty con consistent, we can see that we saw a 22% increase from zero, no choline, extra from, from the feed to uh, 60 gram of rumen protective choline, okay? It's pretty consistent. So now the idea was, okay, we, we know that we can, we can modify the concentration of, of, of choline metabolites in the plasma of pregnant, not lactating cows. So let's see what happened with those offspring that are born from this cow. So we had only two treatments in one of the trials, zero, versus 60, that's why I'm showing only the 60 gram of rumen protective column, okay? This one was the first trial that we did in 2016. It was published in 2018. And basically what we did, we have two groups in the close up period, a control group and a co uh, another group of cow fed rumen protective column. We use, again, reassuring this, uh, in this experiment, we use 60 grams of uh, this product. One of the same thing that we saw, this is the meal yield of the cow. Just uh, later on, I will tell you what I'm showing this, but here we have energy corrected mean of the two groups, control and rumen protected choline. We fed the rumen protected choline during the transition period, three minus three weeks before calving two, three weeks after calving, we follow up these cows or the mean yield up to 15 weeks post-calving. Post, post and we can see that the increase on meal yield is around 2.2 kilos in those cows that were supplemented with rumen protected choline, we can see. But the most important is that when we remove the choline from the diet, here at this dashed line, we can see that the, we can see the carryover effect. We can see that the Energy corrected meal kilogram per day keep keep higher in the group that were fed rumen protected choline. Okay, so we have a carryover effect at least for more than 15 weeks, or at least for 15 weeks. Okay, we follow this curve, and the same trend was observed up to 40 weeks. Okay, but the most important of the talk is what happened with the offspring that were born from these groups. Okay, from this from the choline fed group or the control group, okay? We have only 17 heifers that were born from mom not supplemented with choline, and 18 heifers that were born from uh, dams supplemented with rumen protected choline, okay? And we follow what happened with those, uh, with those heifers, okay? We have a tendency for lighter body weight uh, for the choline treated group, for those heifers. But then we can see that at one year old, those heifers, the heifers that were exposed to in utero to choline, were 13 kilogram, kilograms heavier compared with the control one. And then one week after calving, those heifers were 36 kilogram, kilogram heavier than the control one. We can see here, 534 versus 570 kilograms. Okay, so basically those heifers that were exposed to choline in utero tend to have better average daily gain compared with the control ones, okay? But we, at this point, we didn't know why, okay? Just, we was a retrospective kind of trial that we only uh, followed the body weight of these heifers. 
something that we know for a long, long time is that heifer has the same age, but they are heavier at birth, at calving, they will produce more milk. We can see here weight at first freshing, a meal yield, we can see that this line is uh, have a positive trend. Basically, the heavier the heifer is at freshing, the more milk she will produce in the first lactation. And we know that we have some target. We want 82 to 85 percent of in the of body weight. We want 82 to 85 percent of mature body weight in those heifers, okay, to be able to produce enough milk in the first lactation. Especially what I see today in the field is that we have more than, uh, in average probably we have 40% of fertile lactation in the herd. So it's really important to achieve this goal in order to, uh, to produce milk and increase the overall average daily milk of the herd. What happened with those slides? These are body weight of those heifers two years later after birth. So we have, this is uh, actually the first lactation of those 18 and 17 heifers that we track. These are week after calving. In this axis, we can see the body weights in kilogram. Do you remember that I told you that those control heifers here in blue, representing in blue, had 36 kilo, kilogram less of body weight at first week of lactation, we can see here. And these one are the heifers that were exposed in utero two years uh, uh, before this, this event, okay? And we can see here that this heifer, the control one, tend to have better growth rate in the first lactation. Basically what they're trying to do is to catch up the body weight that they couldn't have here in the first place, okay? So if this heifer put energy, body weight in the first lactation, actually they will do it, but they will sacrifice milk yield. And here we can see the mean yield of those heifers, and we follow those heifers for 40 weeks. And we can see that here in orange are the calling, uh, the heifers that were exposed to utero, calling, calling in utero, and the, in blue, the heifer, the, the control heifers, okay? And we can see that the heifers that were heavier or exposed to, coo, uh, to calling in the uh, prepart, and we can see that they produce more milk, basically because the partitioning of energy went to milk rather than body weight, okay? But we have a difference of 2.2 uh, kilograms per day for the whole lactation, although it was not significant. So now we, we are collecting data from the second try to see uh, if we can see the same trend. The second trial that we did was more in deep. We wanted basically to track uh, the same, uh, the most important was the body weight of heifer exposed to calling in utero, but we wanted to know to do more measurements to see uh, why, why that happened. If that is repeatable, we wanted to repeat the result basically. We have a two by two factorial, we have a hungry cows here. And then basically we have 50 cows that were controlled and 50 cows that were fed room and protected calling. Actually, again, we use reassure in this trial. And then what we did is collect colostrum from these heifers, from these cows, and basically we split the group in two. Okay, basically we have a two by two factorial. So we have colostrum from the group, this group, the calling treated group, and the control group. And basically we see colostrum. So Half of the heifer born from this group received calostrum from the control cows and half received calostrum from the calling fed cows and the same from this group. But again, most of the result that we saw in this trial was regardless, regardless to this treatment, prepartum calling supplementation. And that's what I'm gonna show now. So these are some of the, the some of the material methods just to understand a little bit better what we did. Basically, we have 59 females, offsprings, females offspring, that are, they were born from parus hosting cows. The prepartum diet was uh, formulated to have these are actual values: 148 megacalories for of net energy lactation per kilogram, kilogram, 15.8 percent of crude protein. 2.9% of methionine as a percentage of MP. We use, um, we, we, we really were really aggressive on the lysine methionine ratio to 2.55. Uh, 
uh, we use the NDS program to, to formulate for lysine and methionine. The room and protective calling, again, was reassured, was top dress at zero or 60 grams per day for the last 21 day of gestation. Calves were separated from dams within 30 minutes of birth and assigned randomly to receive calostrum. We fed 3.8 liters of good cal quality calostrum and we measured the quality based on, on bricks unit. Uh, here you can see that we fed all the calostrum that we fed was greater than 22 uh, bricks units. It was collected after birth, within the, an hour after birth, and stored from an experimental dam supplemented with or without rumen protective coating. Um, we fed that calostrum using a, a sofa gel feeding tube. And then we fed only 2.8 liters of milk replacer at 15% dry matter twice daily. And we, uh, we always set a limit on access to grain started started and water from day one. Some of the results that we saw from this trial, this trial was conducted in 2017 and it just has been accepted in the Journal of Daily Science. And basically I want to show the meal production of the daily cows or the mums, just to show you how repeatable are the results with at least from the transition cows. And we will see that the, it's the same uh, repetibility on the offspring. We can see energy corrected meal of this cow. These are the calling fed group, 50 cows, and we have the control one, 50 cows again. We fed reassured during the transition period, three weeks before calving, three weeks after calving. We saw an increase of 2.2 kilo per day for, of meal, energy corrected meal. But the most important again, once we remove the calling from the diets at 21 day, um, after calving, we can see that the meal yield, the increase in meal yield uh, persisted. Okay, basically there is it's a carryover effect of calling supplementation during this period. Okay, pretty consistent results, at least in Florida. So now coming back to what we saw in the offspring. This is dry matter intake during the first 21 days of age of those heifers. Okay, remember that we we had 59 heifers, okay? So basically what we saw here is that if those heifers are born from mom supplemented with rumen protective calling during the last 21 days, we can see the dry matter intake, the milk replacement intake rate is uh, greater compared with the control one. The control is blue, the calling, calling fed cows are orange. We can see that the main difference during this week. This week is when we report or we see most of the diseases in the first 21 day, diarrhea and so on. So we have a decrease basically because we have a high uh, pressure of diseases and we can see that the control have a deeper drop compared with the calling fed uh, or the uterus or the calling exposed to co um, calling during the uterus, okay? But why this happened? That's pretty interesting, okay? And when we look at the starter intake, we can see that again, those heifers exposed to calling in utero has better dry matter intake of started, at least a tendency, okay? And overall, we can see that the, these heifers that were exposed to calling in utero has greater dry matter intake in the first 21 day of age compared with the control one, okay? Why that happened? Well, one of the data that we have suggests that probably these heifers that are exposed to calling utero has a better immune system because the data says that this group, the orange, the calling, the, 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 the heifer exposed to calling utero, here we can see, have less incidence of uh, fever during the first 21 day, okay? Compared with the control one, blue here. So we have a almost 26% decrease in fever indice, uh, incidence. Why that could happen? Well, this is pretty a, a pretty busy slide, but I think that is, uh, I hold a lot of information. It's pretty important for us. We have the white cells, the, uh, sorry, the red cells on the top, and then we have the white cells here, okay? Basically, we can see that the heifers born from rumen protected calling supplemented dam had an increased concentration of red and select, select white blood cells. 
what that means? Well, this means probably that the heifer that were exposed to calling in utero, they have more uh, methyl uh, availability of methyl donors, so they can synthesize more uh, red and white cells because these cells, because they have a really high uh, rate of replication, they need this substance like methionine, like calling like the B12 or folic acid. So we can see that uh, time zero, basically after birth, as soon as these heifer touch the ground, we collect a blood sample. Then we collect another blood sample at seven, 14 and 21 days of age. We can see that at birth, those heifer that are exposed to calling in utero, they have greater concentration of erit erythrocytes and hematocrites, okay? Basically, they have more red cells, okay? Which is good. But the most important graph is here. Okay, we can see the leukocyte or white cell, the quantity. Again, as soon as these heifer are born, they call in, the, those heifer that are exposed to in utero, they have 15 to 20% uh, more white cells compared with the control one, and they are able to keep that different up to 21, or 21 days of age. Basically, they have a larger immune system, and that may help us to fight some of the early diseases during the second week of age. That's why we are seeing better dry matter intake. Something really interesting is that the only graph that, if you see the calling, uh, the heifer that are exposed to calling utero are the orange one. You see that most of the graphs are above the, the blue one, which are the control one, right? Here, here, here here and here. No different in this one, no different in plaquettes. But in reticulites, which are the reticulites, these, these, these small guys are immature red blood cells with our nucleus. Basically, maybe they, it's telling us that the control heifer, heifers that are not exposed to calling utero, they lie, lack of methyl donor to be able to synthesize a nucleus from these cells. Basically, they have a lot of more, or they have more immature cells, basically, we can say. So um, it's pretty interesting data that we are trying to keep doing research on this area now. So it is heifer tend to be healthier and ate more dry matter intake during the first 21 day. It was logic to see that the average daily gain from 14 to 21 day of age was greater from the heifer that were exposed to calling in utero compared with the control ones, right? And remember, what happened in the pre-weaning phase is really important for the production of meal, the, the meal production during the first lactation. And when we look at the kilogram of body weight gained from, from birth to weaning, we can see that the control one have around 31.3 kilograms from birth to weaning, and we have a little bit higher uh, <clears throat> kilogram of body weight gain for the coli, the, those heifer that are exposed to coli in utero, 32.7. But the most important at the time for me was just was trying to repeat the average daily gain of body weight of this heifer. So again, we have no coli or heifer that were not exposed to calling in uteros and heifer that were exposed to calling in utero. We have only 23 heifer in each group that reach the 300 days of age. Today we have the data for 24 months and we are trying to analyze that data. But basically what, what is telling us that pretty, pretty much we have the same tendency. At almost a year of age, we have 12 kilograms of difference. So heifers that are exposed to calling utero are heavier compared with the control, 12 kilograms. In the first trial that we did in 2015, if you remember, it was only 13 kilograms. Now it's 12. So basically the same difference. And when we look at the average daily game up to this time, we can see that there is a better average daily game for those heifers exposed to calling utero. But basically because they have better average, be, better dry matter intake during the first 21 day or during the pre-winning phase. So they keep, they have a better, 
the bigger rumen, they can eat more, they can uh, assimilate more VFA, so they have better average daily, average daily game up to 300 day of age. Something interesting, but still we need to do more and more and more research is what happened with the calotron, okay? If we fed colon before calorie. And we saw some interesting results. Still, we are working on that, but we know that this is some really old data from 1947 that show that the concentration of calotron in concentration of choline, sorry, on calotron is pretty high compared with milk. So these are day after birth. So here is representing calotron at half uh, one day after birth, and then they analyze choline in each subsequent milking. And basically we can see that there is a drastic decrease on choline on the uh, transition milk and later on on milk, right? So choline is really high in colostrum and may have some uh, meaning, okay? So we are trying to understand why choline is important on the colostrum. One thing that we saw is that regardless of the diets that the mom received during the prepartum, what we saw is that when we fed that calostrum coming from mom supplemented with rumen protein choline, we saw that those heifers receiving that calostrum had better uh, apparent efficiency of IgG absorption, and we can see here. We can see that regardless the pre Prenatal, prenatal treatment, we can see if the calostrum come from, come from man supplemented with choline, we can see an increase on IgG absorption. Okay, this is pretty important and may have some implication on how choline influences the fat absorption. So we are we're working on this. We, we have just hypothesis of how this may happen. And again, if all heifers receive more calostrum or more IgG, well, those heifers tend to eat more starter. We can see here in orange, those are the heifers that receive calostrum with quote, quote, okay? More choline. So they may have here, there is a tendency for better starter intake, okay? There is an effect of that. So we wanted to do something more uh, in deep, even more, the first trial was more applied, the, uh, this trial was more basic, let's say, and we used the bulls from those, uh, from those experiments. Basically, our hypothesis with the bulls was that uh, bulls that are born from unfed rumen protected choline, again, we use reassure here, during the late gestation and fed calostrum from rumen protected fed dump will have less inflammation from bacterial infection. When I say bacterial infection is that we use an LPS, purified LPS, just to activate uh, the immune system. So again, we have two by two factorial design, but mm, uh, all the effects that we saw in the bulls were related to if those bulls were exploding in utero. Again, we have 52 males come, coming from Paris Holstein cows. The diet was the same. It has 148 megacalories of net energy lactation per kilogram, 15.8 group protein, 2.9% of methionine as a percentage of MP, and a lysine methionine ratio of 255. Again, the dose of reassure or rumen protein calling was zero or 60 grams per day during the last 21 day of gestation. We fed calostrum within the 30 minutes after birth. Uh, 3.8 liters, again, good quality. We didn't discriminate uh, male from females. We, we treat them as, we treated the same. Uh, and we fed 2.8 liters of meal replaced at 15% red matter twice daily with a libitum access of grain starter and water from day one. We use catheter at 21 day of age, uh, actually it was 20.5 days plus minus two, 0.3 days of age, we, we insert a, a catheter to those bulls or to those offspring that were healthy. Uh, we use uh, the veterinary, veterinary service to, to have a second opinion on health of this bull. 
24 uh, hours later of the, the later that we insert the catheter, we use lipopolysaccharide, which is an LPS just to stimulate or mimic and uh, bacterial infection. And we use a really, really small uh, dose. If you look at the literature, probably this will be one of the lowest uh, dose uh, used to do this kind of assays. We, we didn't want to uh, really cause a really bad inf quote, quote, infection. We wanted just to have a really small uh, challenge, just to see how the immune system starts and what happened with the calf. We didn't want to kill any of these wolves. And then we collect blood sample after the LPS challenge at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, A. 10, 12, 24, 30, 36, 48, 60, 72 hours uh, relative to the LPS administration. And you will see those times uh, in the bottom of the graph. What happened? Most of the effects that we saw in this trial were due to those male offspring were exposed to calling in utero. So here is a really, a really simple uh, draw that explain that if we inject or there is a bacterial LPS reaching the immune system, the macrophages will be activated and different cytokines will be released. One of them is TNF alpha, another one is IL-6, and they will go to different target organs like hypothalamus, fat, muscle, and liver. And each of these organs system will secrete or will produce a reaction. For example, in the hypothalamus, we'll have an increased body temperature. If those cytokines stimulate the fat or the muscle, we have a protein and energy mobilization to support immune response. We will see changes in uh, BHVAs, NIFA, glucose, etc. And if they act in the liver, we will see different acute phase protein like uh, Aptoglobin, for example, or SAA, and we will see what happened with all of them. The first thing that we measured was TNF alpha. So we have, remember, this bull offspring or this bull calf have 21 days of age at this time, but this zero represents hour after LPS challenge. So we have zero to six hours only for this essay. And we are representing here the peak in picogram per ml. Basically, in orange, we are representing those bulls that were exposed to calling in utero. And again, in, bl in blue are the control group. And we can see that if those bulls, bulls or those offspring are exposed to calling in utero, we can see a less increase, okay? There is a significant less increase on TNF alpha, okay? Compared with the control group. So we were expecting to see less temperature, rectal temperature. Okay, in that graph, what we saw is this first step. Okay, now we will see we will see what happened with the body temperature. Here we can see rectal temperature. We can have from zero to seventy-two hours after the LPS challenge. We can see that the group of control male. We can see that they have greater rectal temperature especially during the first six hours after the LPS challenge compared with those males that were exposed to calling. Okay, so this data really match with the TNF alpha. So basically they have those offspring exposed to calling in utero, they have less uh, reaction, let's say, so uh, measured by less rectal temperature. One of the things that is pretty quick when we use the LPS is respiratory rate. Basically, after 10 to 15 minutes after injection of LPS, we can see that this uh, animal start uh, breathing heavily, heavily, and we can see that there is some difference between treatment. We can see that the control of those males that were not exposed to calling utero, they have greater respiration rate pretty much for the first 12 hour, even even up to 72 hours. So it's a pretty long period after the, the LPS that occurred here. When we look at the, those males that were exposed to calling, we can see that they have the same rise on respiration rate, 
in the first hour after the challenge, but then they trying to, they, we can see that there is a less, oh, there, there is a, yeah, less respiration rate for this group. And it, it was low again for 72 hours compared with the con one. So it's pretty, pretty nice to see this reaction. So basically it could be less rectal temperature or um, less immune system activation. When we look at the, for example, we will look at the protein and energy now, metabolites, when this cytokine uh, uh, hits the fat or muscle tissue, we can see here, for example, we have the glucose, fatty acid or NIFAS, BHVA, and blood urea nitrogen. So we have from zero to 72 hours after the challenge, LPS challenge, but we can see that the control one, those offspring that were not exposed to conin, they have a drop or a higher or a deeper drop in glucose hmm? from two to eight hours after the LPS challenge compared with those males that were exposed to conin in utero. If you remember some of the work that Lance Bangwan had done uh, recently, is showing that if we activate the immune system, the, the, the immune system will require glucose. And we can see that this is true because as soon as we activate the immune system, the glucose go down, okay? But it seems that those male that were exposed to colon utero, they tend to have a less reaction, okay? Or at least, at, at least they have less consumption of glucose. If they have more glucose, probably they should have less NIFAS. And what is what we see here, those male offspring exposed to colon in utero, we can see that they have a less rise on NIFA or adipose tissue mobilization compared with the control one. And this data is matching what the glucose is saying. If there is more NIFA, NIFA go to the liver, they are processed and secreted as a BHVA. And we can see that here, BHVA relative to our after the LPS, we can see that the control group has higher VHVA at six and eight hours after the LPS challenge compared with the mates that were exposed to colon in utero. So again, the glucose, the NIFA, and the VHVA data really match with the rectal temperature and TNFL, TNFF data that I showed previously. When we look at the glucose, urea, nitrogen, basically it's a marker of muscle mobilization because we need energy and this calf start uh, or enter in a catabolic state mm -hmm. and basically we can see that that zero hour uh, after the lps challenge basically is be zero is before the lps challenge there is no difference between the two groups but after the lps challenge we can see that uh, the control group in blue represented in blue has uh, more blood urea nitrogen meaning that this group of animals were in a more catabolic state compared with the group of uh, male that were exposed to colon utero, okay? And again, it matched the previous data that I showed. And lastly, we can see that what happened is the, those cytokines uh, stimulate the liver. Aptoglobin. Here we have one of the acute phase protein, which is called aptoglobin, and we can see that these are hours after the LPS challenge. Blue is the control group, and we can see that the control group has greater aptoglobin concentration compared with the uh, males that were exposed to colon in utero. Again, uh, following the same trend that previous metabolites. Serum day A is another acute phase protein. We can see the same pattern. The blue is the control group. We can see that that group specifically has more uh, serum amyloid A compared with the male that were exposed to colon utero. Okay, these two acute phase protein they have different behavior. In general, the aptoglobin tend to peak before 36 hours, as we see here, so six hours after the challenge, we can see that there is an increase. And zero amyloid A tend to peak around 30 to 36 hours after the challenge. And we can see that is when we see the difference here. Okay, so pretty nice to see that. Well, what happened with the dry matter intake and body weight of this male? So the, the metabolites look really good, but what happened with, with 
important thing that we like to see, like grammar intake and body weight. So at the moment of the LPS, this was the day that we did the LPS. We can see that the, there was a drop in primary intake comparing with this, with the following days. But if we see drop was heavier or was greater for the control one, probably they have greater rectal temperature and you see, and you saw the data, they were in a more catabolic state compared with those males that were exposed to colon utero. And we can see that after day of zero, or the day that we did the LPS challenge, we can see that there is a recovery in both groups. However, we can see that those males that were exposed to colon tend to recover a little bit better and maintain that difference up to seven weeks, okay, in dry marine intake. We can see that the control group that was subject to LPS challenge, they tend to be below uh, from the day of the LPS challenge up to seven days uh, below to the those males that were exposed to calling utero. There is a kind of carryover effect. And what happened with the body weights? Well, I was expecting if they have better dremer intake, they would be heavier, but we didn't know that data until we analyzed it. Um, basically, there was no difference at birth on these two groups, neither in the LPS challenge. So LPS challenge was done at day 21 days of age, and basically it was a gram per kilogram. So we have the weights of each individual male at 21 day. And basically there was no difference, but what happened at two weeks after the LPS, the, those males that were exposed to calling utero, here represented in orange, we can see that there was a tendency to have uh, greater or behavior compared with the control one, okay? And basically, it's, um, it's a consequence, probably, the better primary intake. Uh, sadly, we don't have primary intake up to two weeks. We have only the first week after the LPS challenge due to uh, uh, lack, of, uh, uh, lack of people to conduct the research, basically. But the body weight is up to two weeks or after the LPS. And this is the data that when we combine the mortality in the first 21 days of age of male and females, offspring, okay? And what we can see the most important is if those offspring are exposed to calling pre and post natal. So during the prenatal will be if the cow receive rumen protected calling during the close up period and then post natal through colostrum. We can see that we didn't have any mortality in that group. However, if we follow this line, we can see that the mortality rate, rate for this group was pretty severe. So this group didn't receive any calling, extra calling during the close-up, or actually offspring were not exposed to calling during the prenatal time, neither through colostrum. So there is something that we are pursuing now because it's a really interesting data but uh, because of the, the power of the analysis, maybe uh, it's not as accurate as we, we want, but the, the study, the, the, we can see that in, there is a significant or tendency to, for those uh, offspring to be exposed to calling utero to survive better, and uh, also for those uh, offspring exposed to calling through colostrum but we want to repeat this in the commercial settings. So in summary of bulls and heifer scalp, in uh, looking at the utero effects, which was most evident during these three trials that we conduct in Florida, we can say that bull and heifer calf exposed to calling biomolecules in utero during the last 21 day of gestation, regardless of colostrum source, had an enhanced ability to cope with challenges prior to winning as evidenced by less severe responses of general systemic inflammation. And what we saw twice is that lower rectal temperature, greater dramatic intake, and very average daily gain, okay? And this was confirmed when we did the last trial with males or bulls that uh, it was more basic research, but we saw the same. Lower rectal temperature, greater dramatic intake, and at the end they have better uh, very white or they were heavier, okay? So with that, this data, we believe that this data provides strong evidence supporting the hypothesis that prepartum rumen protected calling supplementation can program offspring in utero 
for better postnatal performance. And with that, I would like to thank to Dr. Charles Staple, which was my main supervisor, Dr. Jose Santo, which was my uh, co-supervisor, Corwin Nelson, which is the person together with Jose Santo that is following up all this research, Fiona Moussal, which was our vet, um, and a group of people, my colleagues, that were in the farm with me pretty much every day. And also I would like to thank Valken, which sponsored this trial, and really believe on our uh, idea to, to follow these cafers and look at a different thing that nobody before have looked at, at least in ruminants, okay? Thank you so much, and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, there is uh, already some question uh, pending, so I will uh, I will give I will tell you what question have been asked till now. So there has been three questions from uh, UK, actually from Ireland. Uh, the first question is: uh, um, Is there any measurement for calf performance or colostrum quality? Uh, that we can use as part of the rear result challenge to measure eff effectiveness of reassure on farm. For who's not aware of uh, what is the rear result challenge, it's basically a system that we propose on farm to challenge farmers to use reassure. Uh, so we we usually measure just milk production and uh, and uh, health status of the cow. This question is about can we measure something uh, in your opinion about calves as well. That's a good question. <clears throat> uh, some of the data that I didn't show here was that we saw a increase in IgG content when choline was supplementing during the prepartum. And it's something that I commonly see or produce a report to me when I go to the farm. They say they, they tend to see better quality, not quantity, but better quality of calostrum. That's one thing that farmer can track when they are feeding reassured. That, and that's, that's pretty easy. Basically, most of the farm, at least 50% of the farm uh, have records about, about quality, but uh, it's something that people can, can easily measure. Uh, on the calf, I would say that I, I like to measure average daily gain because uh, with few animals, at least 25, 30, 40 animals per, per group, we can see a difference. Uh, the difference is obvious when you measure from day one to 21 day of age, which is complicated to do it because most of the farm measure at birth or and at, uh, at weaning. But still, if you have the body weight at birth and weaning, you can calculate average day again, and that will be a really good measurement to, to assess it at the farm level. So actually are two measurements that I, I follow when we do the real result challenge. And I, uh, and I would add, yeah, I would yeah. add on top that uh, uh, we measure in this trial as well, uh, serum IgG and uh, serum total protein. And this is something yeah. that some of the farmer are doing as well. Uh, not, not all of them, but you can basically take a blood sample of the animals and, uh, and check these two parameters to, to measure uh, basically how the uh, uh, IgG were absorbed from the colostrum, basically how the, immuno, the, the passive immuno uh, transfer was from the mother to the, to the calves. Um, yeah. So second question. Yeah. yeah. Go on, so, uh, Marcus. Sorry. Really it's really important. That was a, that is a really nice measurement to, to assess. I forgot about about it. So thank you so much. So the second question is: uh, Do you think there will be any any additional colostrum in utero benefits feeding rumen prothetic calling earlier in the dry cow period before 21 days pre-calving? Hmm. Well, that's a um, That's a really, really good question. Um, the short answer will be, I don't know. It's something that we want to assess, but probably I would, I will guess, I, I may be wrong here, but it may have more effect to feel more reassured or more calling during the close up than 
reassure for longer because calotron is sensitized in the last period, in the last week before Calvin. The same that mammogenesis is during the last week. So I think that we, if we can potentially increase the dose of calling during the close up, I think that we can see really good benefits, not only in the cow, but probably in the, in the offspring too. So it's something that we want to do as a researcher. Okay. So the last question I have, and uh, I don't know, Tanya, if you have other question. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, with this calf data, uh, should we be looking at feeding rumen protetic calling to suckler cows where the calf health survivability is potentially even more valuable than to a dairy farmer? And well, you, you, st you, you, you live in a country or well, where suckler cows are quite present as well, so probably you could be interested in this as well. Yeah, so I, that's a great question. When we did the results, when we did the, the research at Florida, we had, or we used to have actually 15% mortality, right? Between 13 and 15, which is pretty high. But it's not high for Argentina, for example. It's, called, it's common to see that. So the environment where the offspring are born and where those heifers are raised is pretty challenging. And I think that the effect that we saw in Florida is because the environment was pretty challenging. So I think that the effect, we can see good effects in those environments that are really challenging. Like uh, uh, when, you, when, we, when we let the, the, the heifer to suck the mom, you know, the teeth is not clean. Uh, there is a lot of bacteria contamination through the mouth, so less IgG absorption. Uh, LPS going through the gut. So I think that we can see better results on, on those environments compared with really controlled kind of settings. I don't know what, what is your experience, Stefan? Well, I don't have really an experience, but I guess that ruminants are ruminants. And if we see an effect on dairy cows, probably we will see an effect on uh, beef cows as well and, uh, and oh, yeah. the offspring of beef cows. So. Yeah. Uh, we haven't tested it yet, but but I think it will be. It, it, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it could be very interesting. Uh, the real challenge mainly in beef, and I think it's uh, the same for South America and Europe, is that uh, it's very difficult to convince farmers uh, uh, having suckler cows to to feed uh, something expe expensive uh, uh, during the the dry or the close up and feeding yeah. administration will be difficult as well uh, due to the condition where they are uh, farmed. Um, I, I don't think there are any other question at the moment. Uh, Tanya, can no. you confirm this? Yeah. Okay, so well, if by chance uh, you will have any question rising in your mind in the next uh, uh, days or weeks, uh, don't, do not, I mean, uh, go ahead, send uh, send to me and Tanya your question. We will be happy to forward the question to Marcus and uh, answer them. Um, with this, I would like to thank you, Marcus, first for this presentation, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, we we will we will send out uh, recordings of the webinar uh, in the next few days. So. If by chance you have colleagues or uh, clients that uh, hadn't uh, the possibility to uh, to follow the webinar, feel free to forward the recordings to uh, to them. Um, Tanya, anything else to add? No, uh, that's it. And uh, thank you very much, Marcos, for for your presentation. I think this was a great presentation, and uh, we will have more. Mm -hmm for sure more questions that will come and that we will be able to answer in the coming days okay okay thank you so much everyone Tanya. have a have a good uh, week and uh and keep in touch thank you very much again thank, thank you. you stefano bye Tanya. Bye, bye 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 have a good day